So it's a great pleasure to introduce Vlad Shalayev. He's a distinguished professor in electrical engineering in Purdue University, and uh, it's really a big honor to have a world-class scientist like that, very well renowned in the world in his area in uh, nanophotonics and plasmonics and now in quantum optics, to be here and to give you a lecture on this topic. So Vlad is uh, he's scientific director in, uh, for nanophotonics and brick nanotechnology center in Purdue. He's distinguished professor, or professor of engineering. He got quite a number of very distinguished awards for his work, including Max Born Award from Optical Society of America, Willis Lamp uh, Award from uh, Laser Science and Quantum Optics, uh, William Streifer Award from IEEE Photonics uh, Society, uh, Ralph Landauer Medal, and many, many others. He's a fellow of Optical Society of America, American F Physical Society, uh, SPIE, and MRS, and uh, Optical Society of America, as I said already. So uh, he is an author of over 600 very influential papers uh, with age index, which is unprecedented, of the order of 100. So uh, it's really a great pleasure to have Vlad here, and just in appreciation of his time he spent coming here and giving us this lecture and preparing it, uh, we have a memorabilia plaque that we want to give him as a token of our appreciation. Okay, yes. Uh, well, first of all, can you hear me well there? Wave with the hand, somebody from back rows. Good. Uh, I guess I will start with uh, thanking uh, Yuri for inviting me here. Yuri, of course, is a longtime friend. Uh, and I admire what he has done in his previous scientific life in photonics and now doing entirely something different. I'm also very much impressed with my visit. Uh, I mean, it's tiring, I should honestly say. I saw so many people, and I was amazed. They had so many good ideas. Uh, I'm gonna bring back to Purdue and share with my colleagues. I'm very much grateful to everyone I met today. So what I'm gonna speak today about is what we are excited. Uh, basically, I will talk first about very recent work, all done either this year or not even published yet, on metamaterials. And the, in my opinion, metamaterials is probably the most exciting thing which happened to in the light of science for the last couple of decades. On the other hand, uh, you probably would agree with me that the next technology evolution, which is already here, it's a quantum uh, and in the quantum area. So I will see at least my perspective uh, how metamaterials could actually, in my opinion, make a difference for quantum. Basically merging these two uh, very exciting fields and see uh, how that, uh, what kind of synergy we could get out of this. So this is specifically what I try to cover today with you. First, I will be speaking on so-called meta surfaces. It's basically 2D version of meta materials, and meta means in Greek beyond. When we say meta materials, we imply that we create materials that have properties going beyond those which Mother Nature offers to us. And I will start with truly remarkable uh, nonlinear responses of materials uh, which are sitting on a substrate where index, optical index, the most important characteristic, close to zero, near zero index. Usually it happens when the electric permittivity is close to zero, they're also called epsilon near zero materials. What we showed recently, and this paper is just submitted, not published yet, uh, that by placing uh, meta surfaces on top of this E and Z substrate, these nonlinear responses could be even further dramatically enhanced. I, I would argue this is like a new branch uh, in nonlinear optics, which would enable many exciting things, such as, for example, to control light not only in special domain, and that's what actually metasurfaces are designed for. They uh, uh, make possible almost like unlimited control of a light in space domain, but also in time domain, because these nonlinear responses could be very strong and ultra fast. By taking the idea of metasurfaces, which is a beautiful, concept, I should say, into yet another domain, frequency domain, I will show uh, truly remarkable, simple but remarkable 
uh, beam steering, which could be realized uh, at speeds uh, going by far beyond that uh, demonstrated so far, basically terahertz speeds for beam steering. And the last part is actually what uh, most excites me uh, lately. It's uh, using plasmonic metamaterials uh, to speed up dramatically quantum processes because you're probably aware that one of the biggest uh, obstacles in the field of quantum is decoherence. So instead of uh, fighting decoherence and going to all extremes, what we suggest to speed up quantum processes to the extent that they happen faster than decoherence so that you could do it at room temperature and not worry much about decoherence. And finally, yet another thing we haven't even published yet, but what we learned that absolutely huge difference uh, could be done if you apply machine learning almost to any photonic design. But in this particular case, we will apply it for quantum. I, I think that uh, the role of machine learning is important in all areas involving big data, but in quantum might be particularly important. So as I said, I start with uh, this um, unusual situation when you combine meta surfaces uh, that enable uh, quite unusual control of light in space domain with, uh, uh, with uh, materials where epsilon is close to zero. So let me start with this textbook formula. I'm not sure, I, I assume that most of you have some feeling about nonlinear optics. But this is textbook formula uh, uh, from nonlinear optics, which tells us that refractive index is the sum of the linear refractive index. That's what, uh, of course, we know well, and that uh, controls the propagation of light in the conventional media. But there are also additional terms uh, called uh, current nonlinearity, so, and that proportional to intensity. I teach this course for many years, and the truth is I never paid attention to the fact that this uh, coefficient N2, the core coefficient, of course is proportional chi three, this is so-called nonlinear core susceptibility, but it also inversely proportional to the linear refractive index. Actually, if you use the degenerate scheme where there are only one frequency involved, it's N not squared. <coughs> Why it's important? Imagine that linear refractive index is really small, goes to zero. We know that refractive index is square root of epsilon and mu, the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability. And we know that there are materials where at certain frequency range, the electric permittivity becomes very close to zero. It's called epsilon near zero materials, which means that refractive index, linear refractive index, could be very small. But then you face very unusual situation. The linear term, which normally is much higher than nonlinear term, becomes very small, uh, whereas nonlinear term is enhanced because of small linear refractive index. So we are talking here about the enhancement coming from small linear refractive index. So, and that's uh, quite unusual. This is new way to enhance nonlinear processes. And luckily there are uh, big classes of materials where you could have all this. For example, so-called transparent conducting oxides, uh, which are transparent, that's where the name comes from. Uh, actually have this crossing point where dielectric permittivity goes from real uh, from positive values to negative values around telecom wavelengths. Like in this case, I'm showing so-called aluminum dope link oxide, the material which we actually work in, uh, in Purdue in our group. And uh, depending how much you put zinc there, uh, sorry, aluminum there, you could control where this crossover wavelengths when epsilon goes from positive, which means you're dealing with dielectric to negative, which means you're dealing with metal. And since you're talking about huge change going from dielectric to metal, you should expect dramatic change in properties. So because any change compared to zero is huge. So the relative change in the refractive index here is, could be really dramatically high. And what we see here that this N2, when we approach the wavelengths where this crossover occurs around 1.3 micron, indeed increases as predicted by this formula. So you have nonlinear response which is enhanced by small linear refractive index. Uh, and the uh, fact is that this nonlinear term uh, could be actually significantly larger than linear one. So in this case, by a factor of five, but in our other exper experiments, it could be 10 or 100 times higher than linear refractive index in realistic uh, materials, specifically like transparent conducting oxide. So this is, uh, when you look at the delta M, this change in refractive index normalized by linear refractive index, this is really remarkably large. Uh, 
but it's important that not only uh, this nonlinear response is huge, but also it's ultra fast. So when we measured this time of response of this nonlinear response, it turns out that it to be in 100 femtosecond uh, uh, range. So it's a, it's really sub picosecond. For large nonlinear responses in like in some semiconductors, it's at the best in nanoseconds uh, uh, range. So not uh, femtoseconds. So having such a huge nonlinear response, it's such fast rates, that really uh, opens up new opportunity for doing nonlinear optics. And nonlinear optics, of course, in the heart of all these applications because you need to switch fast, you need to modulate fast. That is really um, very important. And uh, the physical reason behind this is that we are dealing in these cases extre with extremely singular optics. What I say by mean, uh, what I mean by this, that if linear refractive index goes to zero, it means that the wavelengths uh, becomes uh, anomalously large because uh, you should divide the wavelengths in vacuum by refractive index. If refractive index is small, the wavelength becomes huge. The phase velocity, which is C over N, also becomes actually divergent. So it, you will deal in like with quasi-static limit even though you are at the scale much larger than the wavelengths. And that's all because refractive index goes to zero. It's a highly unusual regime because phase velocity basically tends to infinity. In parallel, the group velocity goes to zero. And so it's very unusual situation. And what happens here, because group velocity becomes so small, light moves very slowly in a sense, the nonlinear interaction increases dramatically. But not only that, because the displacement current D, which goes like epsilon times E, should be continuous across the uh, interface. If uh, epsilon goes to zero to keep D discontinuous, field should go to infinity. So which means that you have very strong confinement of field because epsilon goes to zero. These two things, the interplay between strong confinement of electrical field and slow light results eventually in this dramatic enhancement. And to uh, demonstrate this, that it's indeed a very, uh, general effect, not peculiar one. Uh, I should mention that in parallel, Bob Boyd in Ottawa actually did similar experiment with uh, different uh, transparent conducting oxides and for different op nonlinear optical process and then obtained very dramatic enhancement. So uh, if you look at the structure of Maxwell's equation, you have this nonlinear polarization source and here the new generated field and the refractive index here. So when you start looking at like second harmonic, third harmonic, four-way mixing, linear refractive index would always go to denominator, to the denominator. So my statement here, the fact that linear refractive index goes to zero enhances pretty much most of nonlinear optical processes. So that the whole perturbation theory completely doesn't work. You actually have to develop new theory. But at least one thing is clear that you have this dramatic enhancement if linear refractive index for some reason goes to zero. In this particular case, to demonstrate this, we looked at so-called four-way mixing and very thin films. Something what uh, John Pendry proposed a while ago, he said that if you have a very thin film, much smaller than the wavelength, so and if you send uh, a wave at frequency omega, if this film has chi-3 nonlinear response, so that you modulate it at frequency two omega, and then you have this omega incident in such uh, a modulated film at frequency two omega because of this four-way mixing uh, chi-3 process, you would get omega minus two omega, you create minus omega. But negative frequency means time reversal because negative frequency is the same as to reverse time. So you actually have this time reversal in this film and as a result you have a, uh, a beam which goes in opposite direction, so-called phase conjugated beam and a beam goes uh, in the uh, direction which corresponds to negative refraction, negative refractive beams. And if you look at the conversion efficiency, it has this linear refractive index to the power of four. Remember in the Kerr effect, it was uh, power two, here it's power four, meaning that if linear refractive index becomes small, in our case it was 0.2, that thing dramatically increases. And indeed we obtain in a very thin film, uh, uh, enhance like 10,000 times in nonlinear response when you approach the spectral range where linear refractive index is small. But that's already an uh, experiment we done some time ago, uh, actually last year. So that's we did very recently, we just submitted it. 
So in this case, uh, the problem we are trying to address, if epsilon really is small, uh, if you think like engineers in terms of impedance matching, it means that the impedance really is mismatched. It's really hard to get light energy inside of a material where epsilon is close to zero because it's huge mi uh, uh, impedance mismatch. So, but if, however, you place antennas on top of this CNZ material, which is basically a meta surface, that's what meta surface is about, is just uh, a bunch of antennas, then these antennas couple light inside of the NZ material, and that's quite a strong coupling actually opens a uh, way to enhance nonlinear responses. So that's exactly what we did, and we showed that by using this simple model of a couple of oscillators, one oscillator representing ENZ mode, uh, the mode uh, for frequency which, uh, where epsilon crosses zero, another uh, representing frequency of these antennas, and we make it, them the same. So then you see that there is really this uh, fork-like behavior, so it's basically like uh, this repulsion, if you wish, between these two modes. And so what we see that the splitting between the modes caused by this coupling actually uh, exceeds uh, the rates of uh, both plasmonic rays, because these antennas are plasmonic, plasmonic decay, and uh, uh, the decay of E and Z mode, which means it's a strong coupling. Basically, there is a strong coupling between metasurface and uh, E and Z substrate, and because of that, we eventually are uh, able to uh, pump energy effectively in the E and Z. So what we obtain as a result of that, by adding metasurface on top of this E and Z substrate, you see enhancement of nonlinear response by 15,000. So on top of the enhancement, provided by NZ materials because linear effective index is small, as I pointed out, but you have a problem with this impedance mismatch. In this case, we have additional enhancement 15,000 because you very efficiently couple uh, light energy inside of this ENZ material, and we have very good agreement between experiment and uh, full uh, simulation, ability simulations, uh, nonlinear simulations. Uh, that's actually illustrate that these materials could really have truly dramatic responses and ultra-fast responses, nonlinear responses, which indicates that you could control light not only in conventional uh, space domain, but also in time domain. And that's uh, allowed us to introduce what we call space-time metasurfaces and do uh, uh, 4D uh, photonics. So to illustrate this idea, let me uh, remind you how conventional metasurface works. So basically you have a array of antennas and each antenna much smaller than the wavelengths in thickness, it couples to light and when it couples to light it shifts the phase. And if antennas are different along the interface, the shift of phase would be different for different special position. So what you have in this case is a gradient of phase uh, along the interface. So but the gradient of phase means uh, uh, wave vector. So by when you have gradient of phase in space domain, it's like you introduce momentum. So which means that in this case, light when it's, let's say, reflected from such metasurface, instead of going in this regular direction, would go in this some other direction. And you basically break the photon momentum conservation because you introduce additional momentum associated with this phase shift uh, provided by these antennas that depends on special position and therefore you introduce delta k, and as a result, you could send light in any direction, uh, both reflected, right and, uh, reflected light and uh, refracted light. So that's the idea actually of uh, metasurfaces. It's an elegant one because now you control the phase acquired by light beam with the material which could be much thinner than the wavelengths, like as opposed to conventional lenses or other, any other optical elements which accumulate phase when light propagates along this uh, material, here you abruptly change the phase in the way you want. So basically that's the whole idea behind flat optics, which could be much thinner than the wavelengths. You could make lens, hologram, wave plate, whatever. And everything has been demonstrated, much thinner than any optical element. This is a highly productive field. Now lots of companies already started up and already making this ultra thin flat optical element. However, if I send light now in the opposite direction, so it would go exactly in the reverse direction. There is no reason to break reciprocity in this case because uh, to break reciprocity, there is the Lorentz theorem which tells us that uh, you either have to have magnetic field or some nonlinearity or time modulation. 
Otherwise, you would have reciprocal propagation. So what if, what if I have now a surface, metasurface, where I modulate my phase not in space domain, like in the case of conventional metasurface, but in time domain. So I introduce gradient phase of in time domain. But gradient of phase in time domain means shift in frequency. It's like a Doppler shift, for example. So what happens in this case, let's say if my initial frequency was such that this is either frequency surface given by this red curve, light is incident on this meta surface modulated in time domain. Because of the shift in frequency, you would get a different frequency. So that was my new either frequency surface. When I sent it back, it would be again experiencing this shift in frequency. And that would be my yet another either frequency surface. And clearly it would go in a different direction because you change the frequency. So the point here, uh, if you have time metasurface, time variant metasurface, then actually you uh, could enable non-reciprocal behavior. And this is like a holy grail for photonics. Uh, it works like a light, a light diet. It's very important to have this non-reciprocity. And you could accomplish this with this time-variant metasurface. What happens in this case, if with conventional metasurfaces you break photon momentum conservation, now you break photon energy conservation because you change the frequency. And of course, frequency defines the energy of photon. And you do this breaking of uh, photon energy conservation with this time-variant metasurface. So, and the, how it's related to what I just said, for that you need materials which modulate properties strongly in a fashion. And the materials which I just introduced do exactly that. To take it to, to yet another interesting dimension, uh, I want to relate it to photonic crystals. It's a huge field with lots of interesting things. Uh, and in photonic crystals, what you have, dielectric properties, dielectric permittivity is periodically modulated in space with a period comparable to the wavelengths. What if I now periodically modulate the electric permittivity in time domain? Then I would have photonic time crystals. But similar, because of the duality of Maxwell's equation, space-time duality, you know that conventional photonic crystals, all the beauty related to their application is because you have this forbidden uh, energy uh, zones, so-called band gaps. So here, because I modulate it not in space domain, but in time domain, I would have these band gaps in K space, not in energy space, but in K space. But that also should result in very interesting new optics. And to tell you the truth, we just started to work on this. For example, it could enable so-called Flaquet photonic time uh, crystals and uh, topological insulators. That's a very exciting area. So, but I guess my point here that if you have this luxury to modulate properties strongly both in space and time domain, you really could do uh, exciting uh, new objects. So let's, uh, as one uh, famous character from one Russian novel says, if you're dreaming, why should you limit your dreams? So, okay, so the concept of metamaterials and metasurfaces is a very powerful one. When we took it from space domain to time domain, we obtained this non-reciprocity, all this very interesting effect. Let's take it to frequency domain. Let's now have gradient of frequency in space, what you would obtain in this case. And what I am about to show you that you would have ultra fast beam steering without any additional sources of energy. And to explain this, let me refer to conventional beam steering. The way you do beam steering, you have a ray of antennas. And you control the phase, they're all in the same frequency, you control the phase between neighboring antennas. And when you modulate it with external source of energy, uh, like liquid crystals or gate tunable metasurfaces, uh, lithium nearbytes, whatever, you modulate the phase, then the uh, direction where constructive interference occurs would be different. So let's say initially it goes in this direction, then I change the relative phases, it would go in that direction. But the fastest modulation you could do in this way is in my microsecond uh, time scale. Basically, it's like megahertz. And normally it's even lower than that. So what if I completely change the game now? Let's lock the phase for all these antennas. Now phase is the same, but frequency is different. So I'm different in such a way that the difference in frequencies between neighboring antennas is fixed and the same, and they are specially separated. I guess the best way to think of this, all of you heard of this, uh, uh, of this for example, like uh, 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 mod-locked laser, or when you have actually this many frequency, 
many frequencies and they have the same phase but separated. But normally they are located in one and the same space, uh, in one and the same special point. What they think to do is you take this frequency comb and place different spectral components in different special positions. Uh, you see, that's simple. Frequency comb, different spectral components I need to place in a different special position. And no any other source, it's just pure interference. What happened next? Because the phase for this antenna propagates faster, the frequency is faster, uh, higher than here than here, and uh, for this antenna faster than for this one, so your, uh, your beam would start bending. And it would periodically, the direction where constructive interference occurs would be periodically changing. You actually swept the light uh, over all these different uh, directions and it happens by itself because you have this constructive interference in the angular direction. That's actually how it looks like. This is specifically, we use the uh, frequency difference between neighboring antennas, 100 gigahertz. So, and basically with picosecond time, 10 picosecond time, it rotates. And no any external source of energy, I want to emphasize it. So some of you might ask why it's actually bent. But we normally are used to the fact that uh, light propagates along straight lines, rays. So the statement here is always bent. We just don't see it because we never experience such high speeds with conventional beam steering. Let me illustrate this point with this uh, simple uh, picture, which uh, my student actually, uh, uh, Amr Shaltaut, who is behind these ideas, suggested, and the experiment was done when he moved to Stanford, uh, but he did it actually when uh, he was a student in Purdue. It's very simple. Let's say if the beam steering occurs with the speed like 10 picosecond, within 10 picosecond, uh, photons, which of course propagate along straight line, uh, travel over a distance three millimeters. Let's say initially my photons are here, but in 10 picosecond, because steering already occurs, it would sit here and here. So uh, basically it's very similar to curved water stream when, uh, rot when you rotate fast the water hose. It's exactly the same story. However, if my speed of rotation is not comparable to speed of propagation, then of course it looks like a straight line. So if the speed of rotation is comparable to the speed of propagation, then you have this bending. So that's illustration how taking the idea of metal surfaces first from space domain to time domain, you have this non-reciprocity, taking them to frequency domain, you have this uh, amazingly fast uh, uh, beam steering. So, but the idea is so straightforward, of course we should be able to realize it experimentally. And the simplest possible way is to take a frequency comb generated, for example, by mod locked laser, send it to a diffraction grating. What diffraction grating does, it sends different frequency in different directions. So then you have a lens and then you focus different frequency component in, the fre in different frequency uh, uh, special positions. So there are no really antennas here. It's a virtual metasurface, but different frequency would sit in position and therefore they should be able to do exactly the game I just described. But this is old fashioned way. The whole idea of metasurfaces, you could replace any optical element with a uh, much thinner counterpart based on metasurface. Like one metasurface could act as a diffraction grating, another metasurface could act as a lens, but since I'm dealing with linear optics, I could combine and make one single metasurface which would, da which would do all both functions, which would uh, do both functions. So that's the idea, and that's a realization. It's simple silicon-based metasurface, absolutely nothing special, very simple fabrication. Here is all the parameters. So you send the light. This is focal point where you have this virtual frequency array uh, metasurface. And then you image with the street camera and indeed you see that within 10 picosecond, uh, the position of beam uh, goes from minus 15 to plus 15 degrees. And you could control it. You could increase the, uh, the, the, the scope of the angles. It just uh, comes down to design. So the idea of metasurfaces, as I said, taking from space to time domain to frequency domain really uh, enables uh, wonderful new physics. So let me move on and uh, speak of things which perhaps most exciting to us. And uh, a person who is pretty much behind this work and led this effort, it's Simeon Bogdanov, who is actually starting from January, moves to ECE in uh, this university. And uh, I'm sure uh, with him you would get quite a great asset because he's a fantastically talented young man. 
So the idea here is of, comes down to this plasmonic speed up, which I already mentioned. So what we say that if you somehow would be able to speed up quantum processes that they happen so fast that they beat the rate with which decoherence occurs, then it would become immune to decoherence. So that's the idea. It's not like we have done it, but I think we have the roadmap uh, to enable it. So more generally saying, it's not clear yet which quantum, which material platform would be winning for quantum applications. There is a clear trade-off between interaction strengths where superconducting qubits seem to, uh, to have most promise and coherence where uh, basically photons probably unbeatable because they are very robust structures. And if you look at the, one thing is sure that uh, photonics one way or another, at least in my opinion, would play a significant role in future quantum technologies. And that's because with photons we package information into a signal of zero mass, propagate it the ultimate speed, which is speed of light, and photons are very robust, as I said. And perhaps by now the most impressive application is the one accomplished by this uh, Chinese group uh, who did this uh, quantum communication through satellite. That's indeed very impressive, but if you look at the speed with uh, this happens, it's on the scale of actually uh, uh, ki kilobit per second. It's a very slow, it's almost like, for photonics, it's almost like a shame. I mean, I mean, photonics, it's, you always should think of very high rates. Here it's kilobit per second, or even lower. And the reason for that is actually exactly why photonics is so good. I mentioned that photons are robust. They don't interact with each other and they very weakly interact with matter. But for some applications, you need to actually have strong coupling of photons to matter to generate, for example, photons, single photons, to control them, to switch them, to detect them. You need to have strong coupling on demand, if you wish. And that's actually the challenge to accomplish. And the way to do it is in principle well known. It's so-called Purcell enhancement. So basically, you place your unit, quantum units, to be specific, let's think of now a single photon source. Although it could be applied to single photon detectors, switches, because it's a very general concept. Let's think of single photon source. And I would like to increase light matter coupling. So if I place it inside of a cavity, because basically you have this multiple coupling, so you increase the, in, the light matter interaction, and the enhancement goes like Q, where Q is the quality factor of your cavity, over volume where your light is confined. And most of teams take this approach when they use these uh, cavities with very high dielectric, with very high quality factor. Like for example, photonic crystal, defect based, you have this quality factor which could go up to 10 to the eight. But volume in this case is limited by the diffraction limit because that's the way uh, photonic crystal cavity works and that's the smallest possible cavity uh, conventional one. So, but uh, the claim here that the higher Q, the slow response. You pay the, the price. You know that the higher quality your resonating system, no matter what, the slow response would be. We come back to the same problem. So I mentioned that you have very these slow rates which you would like to speed up. So, and therefore what we propose that instead of going to high Q, let's use modest Q like 100, and that like, brings me to plasmonics and plasmonics in the heart of metamaterials. So with plasmonics, you have all type of resonances like non-antenna forming metasurface, and the quality factor would be around 100. But volume where you can find electromagnetic radiation could go way beyond the diffraction limit. Basically, by using so-called gap plasmons, you could confine electromagnetic radiation down to five nanometers. If you compare it to 500 nanometers, it's 100 times smaller. Since you have here volume, it's, you have a million factor enhancement just because of the confinement. An additional enhancement on the range of 100 comes from the fact that you have this quality factor with, which is around 100. But the fact that quality factor is not large, it's exactly what we need. It means that the response time would be fast at terahertz rates. Typical rates at which plasmonic structures operate is terahertz. It will be broadband and fast. So basically you get the same enhancement in light matter coupling as you would obtain with dielectric cavities, but the system would operate much faster. And that's a simple idea. So we do need to increase light matter coupling. 
We can do it with plasmonic structures, but as opposed to dielectric structures, it operates very fast, a terahertz rate. Simple and straightforward idea. Uh, and that's basically straight this point. So uh, let's say with conventional approach, when you have this dielectric cavities, for example, based on photonic crystals, so you have this uh, high Q and uh, you to, to, to beat the decoherence process, what you do, you either trap ions or trap atoms or go to extremely low pressures to extremely low temperatures so that coherence time increases because you basically control your system as much as possible. What we are suggesting, instead of doing all this extreme uh, uh, thing to accomplish, let's it go its way. Let's go to room temperature where decoherence is particularly high and rate is very high, but we speed it up the process so that it happens within the time before decoherence happens. So like in the case of, uh, let's say single photon emission, let's say the time of emission of a photon would be shorter than the time of dephasing. And then my photons would be indistinguishable. And one of the biggest, I mean, single photon source is important. And I actually visited Paul Quake uh, today and fantastic single photon sources, record high efficiency. It's very important to have indistinguishable photons and at room temperature that could make difference for quantum photonics. And that in principle could enable all that. So how to do it? So the idea we have in mind is to use this gap plasma, which could be uh, accomplished by placing single crystal silver cube atop of single crystal silver field. And if I put inside some quantum emitter, in our case, it's a nanodiamond uh, with, for example, nitrogen vacancy, although we are now working on other type of emitters. So then the size of the gap would be basically dictated by the size of nanodiamond, which could be very small. And that's why electromagnetic radiation would be confined. That's where you get this uh, per cell enhancement. But the other trick is not only to have strong increase in light matter coupling, but you also would like to outcouple these single photons before decoherence happened. So it means that this antenna should be very efficient. It actually should match the impedance between these plasmonic modes, gap plasmons, and for free propagating modes. For that, the antenna should not be too small. It's roughly like 100 nanometers. And then it would, let's say, you would create these single photons at terahertz rate in antenna, outcouple these photons into free space on a waveguide at the same rate before decoherence happens. And ideally, before any plasmon decay happens. And in principle, according to the calculations, it certainly should be possible. So it's like loss-free plasmonics at rates that be decoherent. So uh, first, let me show a kind of old already experiment we did. In this case, we just randomly distribute nanodiamonds on a uh, silver surface, then randomly distribute nanocube. And in some uh, cases, just accidentally, you have the situation when nanodiamond is sitting between the cube and, uh, and this uh, silver surface. And we do this measurement of G2. G2 is correlation function. And so when you have this deep uh, going below 0.5, it means that you're dealing with single photon source. So, and what we obtain that if you first have nanodiamonds on glass and then you have this in this situation, you actually have dramatically increase in the rate with which you prov uh, produce the single photon up to 30 million photon per second. At room temperature, actually, it's record. As far as I know, it's still not beaten for room temperature. And that happens exactly because of this uh, per cell enhancement. So however, in this case, it's really not controllable experiment. And uh, the enhancement is far from being optimal. And by the way, it's 30 million, but if you take into account that the collection efficiency of your detector is 70%, the angular collection is uh, 50%, and the total transmittance for the whole optics we use is 25%. It means that actually we produce around uh, half uh, billion photons per second at room temperature. So how to do it in a better way? So what we do, we first distribute these nanodiamonds on a glass substrate, then use AFM tip, pick up a nanodiamond for which we checked the correlation function, and we know that it's a good source of single photons by measuring this G2, this antibunction uh, correlation function, and place it on the epitaxial silver. So next, we place their cubes of silver, also single crystal, and with the AFM tip, just push it toward this nanodiamond and push it so that it climbs the top of this nanodiamond and nanodiamond sits exactly the edge of the cube. That's where the pure cell enhancement is the largest, as calculations show. So then you have a wonderful situation because you get the 
largest possible enhancement. You also could excite spin degree of freedom of your nano diamond and for nitrogen vacancy actually spin degree of freedom has very large coherence, relatively large coherence time which is important for uh, potentially for uh, memory, quantum memory. So you could excite it with microwave radiation and you could read that spin state optically by using this light. So that's the system. So that's basically how it uh, it's done, actually, it's amazing if this work done by undergraduate student who now moved to Harvard. I, I, I just cannot, every, everyone whom I tell that they can, cannot believe how undergraduate student could do this. So, but that, that's the truth. And she's a truly amazing, uh, talented young lady. So you could see that that's a G2 function for NV center in nanodiamond on glass. And you pick up this uh, nanodiamond, place it on silver, and uh, then you push this cube and then it, it gets at top of this nanodiamond, you measure again this G2 function, you could see that it, it indeed this dramatic enhancement. This is in more detail, let's see the size of nanodiamond is 20 nanometers, and you control it with measuring the height after placing uh, nanocrystal of silver at top of nanodiamond, it becomes 120 or so height, which clearly means that this uh, nanocube is sitting at the top of nanodiamond. And what we obtain is, it's actually that Time shortens by 3,500. Uh, it's a really dramatic one. And the uh, rate with which spontaneous emission occurs is actually 23 picosecond, which is record uh, fast decay rate. And we cannot even measure with CW or with picosecond sources G2 function because the time resolution does not allow to do this. We have to use actually femtosecond pump to measure this G2 correlation function, which clearly uh, proves that we have exceptionally high rate of production of single photons. So, but the truth is with nitrogen vacancy, the coherence is crazily high because of coupling to phonons. Uh, because of the symmetry, the coherence rate in that case is so high that even with all the enhancement we doing, it's hard to beat. So we don't want to probably beat the coherence at that system. We want to look at other ones. And that's what we're still looking. We're still looking for good quantum emitter with reasonable decoherence, decoherence rate at room temperature. Potentially, it could be, for example, germanium vacancy. In that case, the rate, uh, the rate of spontaneous emission is nanosecond, and the dephasing rate is between 0.1 to one picosecond. So you actually have to have this enhancement in light matter coupling, this increase in spontaneous emission around 1,000 to 10,000. And for the previous system, we already demonstrated 3,500. We should be able to do demonstrate it now, but we need to, uh, to learn how to work with these good quantum emitters. And that's what we are doing right now. But at least clearly the concept uh, works and we should be able to do it. Another important application I already mentioned that nitrogen vacancy has also spin degree of freedom, which could be used for memory to record memory, to, to, to record bit like one or, uh, or zero. So that's the spin degree of freedom, which you could actually initiate by microwave radiation, switching from a zero to one by sending these pi over two pulses, for example. And you could read it optically, which is very important. But to read it optically, you have to do it fast because this time, when you pump it too long with optics, eventually everything would go to a state S equals zero. Because of this non-radiative channel, the, there is a symmetry in fluorescence for state with projection one, spin projection one, and state with projection S equals zero because there is this non-radiative channel. So if you pump too long, everything would go eventually here. So you have to detect your spin state within the time shorter than the lifetime of this metastable state, which is 300 nanosecond. But within 300 nanosecond, conventionally you have only like 100 uh, uh, kilo, uh, 100,000 counts per second. Uh, so if you, if you recalculate it for, 100, for 300 nanosecond, you have by far less than one photon. So you cannot detect it. You just have way too few photons. However, if you use this per cell, if you increase the rate with which you produce this photon, then you would be able to read a uh, spin state within one single shot. So that's where this uh, plasmonic speed up also could be very important to optically read spin state. So, and the concept is actually could be taken to other ingredients of uh, quantum 
systems like information systems or other applications. So I already mentioned that production of single photons could occur at much higher rates. You could apply it for quantum frequency converter, for single photon detectors, and also for uh, qubit eventually by applying, for example, by doing, for example, this single photon nonlinearities, which by the way could be enhanced uh, through use of this uh, epsilon near zero materials. So the general concept here that speed up all the processes to the rates which would beat the decoherence and losses and loss rates. And uh, the last part uh, I'd like to spend showing how machine learning actually makes a difference for all this quantum <laughs> measurement. In general, I would say any photonic design based on your intuition, uh, I probably would beat it uh, significantly by using machine learning. I, I, I should say that it's almost like probably old fashioned now to do designs without trying to optimize it through uh, topology optimization and in a more advanced way through machine learning. And that uh, effort is led by Jacques Salih Kudisov, very actually truly genius uh, postdoc uh, from whom I learned a lot actually. So let me be specific. Coming back to this single photon source, the way we do it, as I already mentioned, you do this anti-bunching photon experiment by actually doing this co-detection event. This is standard scheme, let me not go into details, but the thing is, that you measure this correlation function as a function of delay between uh, two beams. We're varying it between minus 400 to 200. This is a very broad spectral range. And uh, you have, you, like, I could split it into uh, 200 beams, that time bits, so that's what I did. And I would calculate how many actually counts I have within every single time beam. So to get this really nice function, you actually have to do this like, many minutes experiment, almost like one hour to get this beautiful curve. And then for that you use famous Levenberg Markart fitting. And then you look at the correlation function with a delay equals zero. And if it's less than 0.5, you have this is a single photon source. Ideally it should go to zero, but there's always some noise. So it's not really zero, but if it's below 0.5, you say it's a relatively good single photon emitter. If it's larger than 0.5, it's not a good emitter. So, but to get this curve, it takes lots of time. So what if I have much fewer counts per time beam? Or let's say if, if I measure it only within one minute. That's how this uh, 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 correlation function would look like. There is no way to get the curve like this. There is no way to use this heat. There is no way actually to determine whether it's a single photon source or not. Or if I do it within one second, that's the way it looks like. It's completely hopeless. If you uh, don't do this long measurement, you really cannot say whether it's a single photon source or not. So that's actually where machine learning comes at hand, but let me first to emphasize again the challenge, because to pick up a good quantum emitter center, like a small size, and we would like to have a small size to get the largest possible per cell enhancement, only one out of thousand nano diamonds actually has one single NV center and could be potentially good single photon emitter. And for each one, you have to have many minutes experiments. So it's completely, it's, it's completely impossible, particularly if you think of like real quantum information, where quantum photonic circuitry, where you want to put thousands of these single photon sources. For rapid prototyping, you really have to do it much, much faster. It's, oh, let's say it speeds like, it's, it's simply impossible basically. Let's, let's put it this way. Unless you speed it up significantly, it becomes simply impossible. So, and uh, the idea is simple. You basically train your, classifier, and in this case you're dealing with classifier, single or not single photon source, by using this sparse data collected within one second or so, and retrieve corresponding labels by doing these complete experiments, and you could train with 15 or so nano diamonds by using this one second experiment, your uh, neural network, and eventually you could say whether it's good or not in a very fast fashion. So we use many actually five different machine learning approaches I show in here too. One is based on convolutional neural network, which is consists of this input layer, three uh, hidden uh, convolution uh, neural networks and uh, followed up by this connected uh, two layers, fully connected two layers of classification. Uh, in this case, we use this package called Keras package. Another uh, machine learning approach we used, uh, it's called so-called Wadding Classifier, which is based on logistic regression uh, and the K nearest neighbor algorithm. So, and in this case, we use this scikit-learn uh, package. So, and here are the results. So if you 
do this collection time like one second, very sparse uh, set of data. So with conventional way, by using this uh, direct fitting, the uh, fidelity of your prediction, fidelity is the number of events where you correctly predicted whether it's single photon or not emitter to the total number of events. So it's basically around 50%, meaning that it's random guess. Of course, it's either single photon, not single photon. So it simply means it doesn't work at all. So with, with this machine learning uh, approach, with a fidelity close to 80%, you actually could say whether it's single photon source or not. That's a clearly difference. And as I said, for rapid prototyping, when you have to deal with many uh, elements on your quantum photonic circuitry, there is no way to do it other than using machine learning as far as you could see it. So we did actually simulations, we did experiment. So, and in both cases, here I'm showing the number of this uh, counts your time bit, which is proportional to how sparse the, your set of data is. So in the, uh, it's also related to how short is your collection time. For short collection time around one second, or when you have just few bins, uh, pure, uh, few, few, few counts per bin, uh, you would basically with conventional uh, feed, direct feed, your, pre, uh, your uh, fidelity is 50%. It doesn't work in other words. Whereas we, if you're using this uh, voting classifier, it goes up to 84%. So it's not just a difference, it enables something which otherwise would not work. This is an example how machine learning actually could make a difference. So that was the example for characterization of single photon stores. Uh, I pointed out how critical it is to have right antenna which would be able to outcouple it rates faster than decoherent ray. And we use simple cube. Clearly it's not the best possible design. So, and uh, to optimize other systems like cavities, couplers, or antennas, we use this yet another machine learning approach. It's called variational alpha encoder uh, to, uh, to basically to optimize all these structures. And I should emphasize it goes beyond conventional inverse design, be beyond topology optimization. With topology optimization, you start from some random point and probably would end up in some local maximum. To get to the global maximum, actually you have to do this machine learning assisted topology optimization. We use actually topology optimized design as a training set, as a starting point. And in this particular approach, this VAA system consists of couple two uh, 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 convolutional neural networks. One is encoder and another is decoder. So of course what encoder does, it compresses feature uh, of training set to compact space, which is called latent space latent space and D decoder is actually learns to read it out. The important thing, because this is compact space, you actually could do here global optimizations, not only optimizing the shape of your antenna or whatever waveguide, but you also could put there all material parameters, uh, their dependence on temperature, their spectral dependence. You could do like genome of optical materials in all this compact space and you could do this global optimization. This is really something which otherwise will be completely impossible. So, and to sum up this part, we believe that machine learning for quantum photonics could really make a big difference. I already showed that you could speed up dramatically this characterization of single photon emitters and do it at the time where it's, which it would be completely impossible with conventional way of uh, doing this single photon characterization. You could apply it for the uh, sp uh, single shot spin readout because even with few photons, when it's very hard, hard to say, to, to determine your spin state by using this training, uh, you still could do it. And of course, you could optimize all these antennas and other uh, waveguides, other components of your quantum photonic circuitry. All right, that actually brings me to uh, my concluding slide. So, I, I'm showing here a very recent result, as I said, published either this year or just not even published yet. But that uh, describes our journey. Uh, on, on our work on metamaterials and metasurfaces, where I think you have really uh, quite unique control over light in space domain, in time domain, and in frequency domain by combining this unique material, such as material with low index, where you could uh, have dramatic enhancing on linear response and very fast response. So you change transmittance, uh, so, uh, like let's say 100% with 110 per second time scale. So you could do this non-reciprocal behavior by basically realizing this space-time at the surface. By taking this idea into frequency domain, you could have this ultra-fast beam steering without any additional source of energy. And uh, taking the 
plasmonics, which is actually a very essential component of metamaterials, to the quantum area, suggests this unorthodox approach to deal with one of the biggest problem in uh, quantum area, which is actually decoherence. And the idea, as I said, straightforward, but uh, we think powerful, basically speed up the rate of processes to the extent that they happen faster than uh, decoherence or losses per, per se, so that even losses wouldn't be an issue. And in all this effort, I uh, truly believe that uh, machine learning makes a huge difference. So I, I, I think like nowadays, it's really kind of not smart not to use machine learning for any photonic design, including quantum photonics. Well, with this, let me thank you very much for coming over and sharing with me the excitement about this uh, recent work. Thank you. We have time for questions, yeah. Any questions around? So the, um, for the classifier, um, you know, the, um, I'm not in the field, so the, uh, there's a latency for that uh, classifier. Uh, would that latency be too long for, uh, for some of the purposes where it's all, uh, the latency is always okay? Well, in, in this particular case, we uh, picked up the classifier, which we think is best suited for, for these things. In principle, as I mentioned, we use five different machine learning packages. It turns out this voting classifier was the best for this particular problem. Although CNN, this convolutional neural network, also did uh, good results. So the thing is that machine learning is like a black box. You don't know why exactly, how it works. So we tried several before we found the best one. Uh, that's yet another thing to understand how machine learning really works and to pick up the best one. In our case, we just found that VC works really nicely. Um, so you mentioned you use the, like, uh, the encoder-decoder networks. Um, I think in, in some cases that gives you the opportunity to use unsupervised learning. Um, how, did you uh, try anything uh, where you have just unsupervised data sets in that kind of situation? Uh, we didn't try it. In our case, it's like what we call supervised machine learning. In principle, you're right. Uh, this is our very first try, I should honestly say. We are, by no means, we are uh, probably the best possible, but we were truly surprised with first effort we got these dramatic results. If you want to take home message here, so we, you are in ECE. There are two parts into this, uh, electrical engineering, computer engineering. I, in my honest opinion, we actually discussed this today, the most two exciting things going on right now, it's quantum technology and uh, machine learning, AI. So what we are doing now, we started to talk out to our computer engineers, people working on, quant on algorithm, including quantum algorithm, and we need to uh, develop common language, we would understand each other. We use so far more or less standard packages which are available. But clearly they could be improved. And we clearly should talk to computer engineers. And uh, I just encourage anyone working in the EE area, particularly with big data set, uh, talk to people working in AI. And I could say with very high probability, you would have quite dramatic uh, improvement in efficiency, whatever you're doing. So we have not done it yet. It's certainly possible. We should look into this. Right. Yeah, the question was whether there is some uh, uh, quenching of this uh, uh, emission of photons from nanodiamond sitting in the gap. That's a good question. The quenching could be the problem indeed, but that's again the same story. Quenching occurs at some certain rate. So similar to like we are trying to beat this quantum decoherence, we actually could and probably do beat uh, quenching rate as well, because we are, we are working at terahertz rates. That's the rate which, which plasmonics works. So to answer your question, we do not see any quenching. And uh, the reason is probably because of the high rates. 
So uh, because we, we can with this terahertz rate, quenching should be in principle there, or certainly could be there. When it's, it's really close to metal, we know there is in principle quenching, but we don't see it. The efficiency, quantum efficiency is very high. So basically what it means that the change, uh, the rate with, um, let's say, the increase in spontaneous emission rate is the same as the increase in the number of single photon emitted, meaning that we don't have quenching. And if you ask me why, most probably because of this high rate with which we emit single photons. So it's like, I don't know whether it's universal solution, but it's kind of unorthodox solution. Do it fast.